Hi guys and welcome back to my channel, the place where we talk about all things tech. And today I would just like to talk about the seriously misguided way that the US Department of Justice has launched its antitrust case against Apple and the iPhone. In their 88 page document, they are essentially claiming that over the course of its 17 year existence, that Apple has illegally built a monopoly around the iPhone that not only makes it difficult to switch to alternatives, but also impedes on innovation and creates a less well-off and less secure experience for all. And while I do understand some of the sentiment, this level of government oversight over the way that our technology is developed is something that I find deeply troubling and is probably actually impeding on innovation rather than encouraging it, the exact opposite thing that the Department of Justice is trying to achieve. Okay, so before we begin, let's just briefly talk about what I would like to see ideally in the smartphone landscape. And I don't believe that it's a position that's controversial at all, because foremost, I do not want to see a monopoly in the mobile space ever. The duopoly that we are seeing right now with just Google's Android and Apple's iOS is already pretty much a disaster in my eyes. For what I would ideally like to see is a landscape where the consumer can just walk into a store and find a phone that perfectly fits their requirements and their taste. Whether they would like to purchase a device that's completely open and ready for tinkering or if they would rather an experience that's completely closed and very polished or maybe they prefer something in between. Ideally there would be multiple software platforms and hardware designs that a consumer could choose from. And just 15 years ago, that's exactly what the landscape was like. BlackBerry offered a very polished but close experience that prized itself on security. Palm's WebOS approached the polish and design flair of iOS, but with the flexibility and openness of Android. Windows Phone offered an experience that was as polished as iOS, but was far more unusual in design and also available on a far wider range of hardware. And it worked tremendously well with a PC but um, was a disaster if you used a Mac. Back then well no choice was perfect you could select a phone that best fit your requirements from the many options available. My personal favorite was Palm's WebOS platform because while it did have the vertical integration and polish of iOS it was also just so great to tinker with and the homebrew community was simply amazing. Apple's iOS was too limiting for me and Android well it was just a bit of a mess but due to a whole host of factors, Palm, Blackberry, Microsoft and Nokia as well on that matter have effectively died and now we've just got Android and iOS. Side note here, I find it hilarious how the DOJ seems to put the blame of the failure of the Windows Phone platform on Apple when it was Android who not only stole the hardware vendors from Microsoft from the Windows Mobile days by offering a free alternative that did not require a license fee and it was Google who refused to make any apps for Windows Phone out of the fear that they would create a legitimate third competitor. When Microsoft made a YouTube app themselves because Google refused to do so, Google actually changed the API APIs and effectively shut it down. After all, who would want to buy a phone that couldn't even play YouTube videos? Where was the DOJ when that happened? Okay, so we are in a situation now where there are only two choices and luckily they exist on opposite sides of the scale. We've got iOS if you want a closed, polished experience or you can have Android if you are a person who can put up with some bugs for some more openness and flexibility. To turn one of them into the other would be a complete disaster for the consumer, but I'm afraid that is exactly what is happening. Through both the EU's mandates and now the US's DOJ, Apple is being forced to adopt features that go against its mantra. So ultimately, if this were to continue, we will be left with realistically only one choice. You can have Google's Android or Apple's version of Android. Now that would be a proper nightmare scenario. So a lot of people are making mention of the DOJ case against Microsoft in the 1990s and creating parallels with what's happening today. And while I can see where they are coming from, the DOJ's case against Microsoft was ultimately a completely different kettle of fish. What happened there was actually both quite alarming and fascinating at the same time. And I would totally recommend that you read into it if uh, you're interested at all. It was largely based around the browser wars that were happening 
happening during this time. And upon saying that the internet was indeed the future, Microsoft used its position of having Windows shipped on 95% of all desktop computers sold, an actual monopolistic position by the way, to quash all competition in the browser space, namely Netscape. When Netscape turned Microsoft's offer of a special relationship down, Microsoft not only retaliated by giving Internet Explorer away for free on all Windows computers sold, but they actually worked to actively remove distribution channels for Netscape, which is something that is both actually disgusting and illegal. After the conclusion of that case, while Netscape was dead, Microsoft returned in a weakened position and had to abide by a long list of acceptable conduct rules. And of course that led to the flourishing browser market that we see today, or at least more flourishing than it was back then. Back to the Apple case now. During a press conference announcing the lawsuit, Deputy AJ Lisa Monaco said that Apple's efforts have smothered an entire industry. But is that really the case? While Microsoft owned 95% of the desktop market in 1999, let's look at what Apple's market share is today in the mobile market. According to StatCounter in the United States, Apple's market share is 60.3% as of February 2024. And while that is alarming, it is far from the 95% of Microsoft. To put it into perspective though, that's actually not that far off from where BlackBerry was at its peak 15 years ago. Globally, it's even less monopolistic. As of the fourth quarter of 2023, Apple held only 24% of the market, with Android taking the remainder. So if you really wanted to then, you could sort of make the case that it is Android that's a monopolist and not Apple. Uh, but that's really beside the point because Apple really does have an elevated influence on the mobile market compared to its market share. A study has suggested that 85% of teenagers in the US prefer iPhones and it is because of that elevated influence that Vanderbilt Law School professor Rebecca Hoare Allensworth claimed that the DOJ told a very coherent story about how Apple is making its product, the iPhone and the products in it, the apps less useful for consumers in the name of maintaining dominance. Well, the problem with that statement is that that is exactly what every phone brand has done in the past. You create features that remain exclusive to your platform so that customers will be attracted to it. The last thing on any company's radar is to also create these unique features that probably cost billions in R&D to develop and develop them for their main competitors. We don't see Google offering their AI models to Apple, do we? Because in order for a company to succeed, there does need to be some stickiness there. So let's take a brief look at the DOJ's main points now. So the first one is super apps. Now this is a super weird one for them to mention because in the West at least, super apps really aren't a thing. The most well-known example of a super app is WeChat, which is quite dominant in China, which is basically a social media platform, cross messaging platform, cross payments platform, cross gaming platform, e-commerce, and a whole lot more wrapped all into the one app. So essentially you can have a phone with just one app on it. Now just ignoring that this is Elon Musk's wet dream for X to create the everything app, this is just not something that we typically want in the West. Facebook is probably the closest thing we have, but we are already quite hesitant to trust Facebook as it is. Do we really want to trust them with our banking needs, our shopping, music, movies, rideshare data, and more as well? Probably not. The market has said no to super apps and it's a real reach to say that Apple has had much say in their lack of success in the West. So next up, we've got streaming gaming apps like Nvidia's GeForce Now and Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. And to be fair, it's hard to disagree with the DOJ on this one. These platforms allow you to stream a library of high quality games directly onto your phone. And Apple has made it so difficult for these apps to exist in the app store that these apps have been relegated to just being web apps. To submit such an app to the App Store, not only did Apple want to continue to collect 30% of all proceeds, but they also required each game in the library to be submitted individually to Apple to review. Now, Apple's revulsion to this class of app is fairly obvious, as these games are being streamed. So not only will there be little advantage to upgrade to the latest phone with the latest, fastest processor for gaming, as all phones would have similar performance, but it would actually take away from the carefully created App Store experience that Apple is known for. But the problem for the DOJ now is that, well, 
the EU got there first. With EU guidance, Apple has actually relented already and I would say that that is definitely a win. And now we come to messaging apps, namely iMessage. The green bubbles. It's easy to understand the DOJ's dissatisfaction with Apple here. Ask most Apple users about the stickiest part of the ecosystem and most would probably say iMessage. The shame of being a green bubble friend would simply be too great for most people. But in a world where third-party multi-platform messaging services are rife, for example, it's impossible for me to delete WhatsApp uh, despite how many times I've tried and uh, Apple finally enabling RCS after EU guidance. Um, is iMessage not being on Android really a problem still? Now do we remember the dominance of BBM or BlackBerry Messenger back in the day? Because people bought BlackBerry specifically to message their friends and colleagues on BBM. Did the Palm Trios and Windows mobile phones of the time want BBM too? Of course they did, but did those platforms also find other ways to keep customers locked in? They sure did. BBM was so popular that there were songs written about it and it wasn't offered on alternative platforms until the very end of BBM's life. In my viewpoint, to simply lock one messaging service to one platform might be a bit of an inconvenient choice for some. But ultimately, it is not egregious and it's certainly not reflective of monopolistic behavior. Unless, of course, you do have 95% of market share and there are no viable alternatives. So is Apple locking iMessage to its own devices an example of monopolistic behavior? I would say that's definitely a no. And finally, we come to smartwatch compatibility. Now, this is quite a big one for me. When I'm testing an Android phone, the thing I miss most is my Apple Watch. And Apple obviously doesn't make their Apple Watches compatible with Android phones. But not only that, but third-party watches, even if they wanted to, they don't get access to all the permissions that the Apple Watch does. So no matter how good a third-party watch might be, they can never be better than the Apple Watch when you're using an iPhone at least. The most annoying one for me is that third-party watches can't share the same phone number as your phone. So if you have a watch with cellular, have fun with a completely different phone number. Because I believe in the freedom for companies to do what they want, well I do understand that this is inconvenient for me as a person who regularly switches between iOS and Android devices. Fundamentally, there is nothing wrong with Apple making the Apple Watch compatible only with the iPhone. Who knows what sort of experience people would have with an Apple Watch on an Android phone. It's not something that Apple would be able to control. And of course, control is what you are getting with the Apple ecosystem experience. On the other hand though, the fact that there are no decent Apple Watch alternatives because of Apple's reluctance to give access to third-party companies is something that's a little bit harder to swallow. Um, while it might make the Apple Watch less popular if it's enabled, fundamentally, I don't see that taking anything away from the core Apple experience because those people buying the third-party watches probably didn't come for the perfectly vertically integrated experience of Apple anyway. So essentially, in this very long-winded video, what I am trying to convey is that, well, I do believe that some of the EU and US Department of Justice's actions have contributed to some positive changes in how Apple operates, Fundamentally, what they are doing goes against everything I believe in. I believe that in order to give consumers as much choice as possible, private companies should not have this level of government interference in how they operate, unless if something truly has gone wrong and there's an actual monopoly that needs to be broken up. And in the case of Apple and the iPhone, ultimately, there is no monopoly. In a world where there are only two mobile operating systems left, it is advantageous to have them as different as possible. There does not need to be interoperability on all levels between iOS and Android, because if this was to continue, Apple would be forced to turn their finely tuned experience that billions of consumers enjoy every day into just another Android. And we don't need another Android because we already have Android. If you reached the end of this video, I really appreciate you lasting this far. This is the first video that I'm making abroad, away from my normal studio, so I do appreciate you not being turned off by this new temporary format. Um, if you enjoyed this video, please like and comment your thoughts and subscribe if you haven't done so yet either. Thanks for watching and uh, toodaloo.